Good morning, everyone. I'm your host. My name is Ben Verhoeven. I'm a doctor in computational linguistics from University of Antwerp, um, where I graduated two years ago. But currently, I uh, am active as a freelance science communicator, and I will moderate this panel for you. Um, I'm very happy to introduce the four following panelists that we engaged for today's session. That's Dr. Vukosi Marivati, Professor Sin Moons, Professor Malvina Misim, and Professor Jan Hayic. They will now also turn on their videos and join us in this panel. This is a moderated panel. That means um, that uh, I will ask questions to our panelists. Uh, sometimes I will direct a question specifically to a panelist, but uh, everyone can always uh, ask for the word and I will give it to them very happily. Uh, we encourage interaction on each other's topics uh, and also from the audience uh, in the Q&A. To start off, uh, my first question is for each of you to introduce yourselves briefly to our audience. Uh, Vukosi, would you like to start? Yeah, uh, good morning and I don't know, evening or very early morning, depending on where you are in the world uh, today. Uh, I'm Dr. Vukosi Marivate. I'm the chair of data science at the University of Pretoria, leading a research group that's looking at uh, natural language processing, as well as data science for society. I'm also one of the co-founders of the Deep Learning in Daba, uh, the largest grassroots machine learning uh, community in the world and also a chief investigator on the Masakane project that is working to democratize uh, natural language processing tasks, uh, specifically for African languages. Okay, thank you. Sin. Yes, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, so my name is Sin Moons. I'm a professor uh, at KU Leuven in Belgium uh, in the Department of Computer Science. I lead a team of about 20 researchers and we are specialized in natural language processing, uh, machine learning, and information retrieval. Uh, yes. Thank you very much. Jan. Uh, good morning or uh, greetings to everyone. Uh, I'm Jan Heitsch from uh, Charles University in Prague. Um, I am a member of the Institute of Formal and Applied Linguistics and also the head of the Czech uh, Clary node called Lin.Claria CZ. Thank you. And Malvina. Hello everyone, I'm Malvina Nissim. I'm a professor in computational linguistics and society at the University of Groningen. And I coordinate our computational linguistics group in the research institute. And I work currently mainly on author profiling and various uh, NLP tasks and recently shifting also to generation. Okay, thank you all very much. Um, it's a panel on artificial intelligence, language, data, and research infrastructures. There's a special role for Claren, of course, in this session. Um, but first of all, um, I want to ask you, but also all of our participants, um, something about your field, because all of you in more or lesser way identify with artificial intelligence. But my question would be, uh, what is the research field or the name for the research field that you most identify with. So in which of uh, these fields that I will show on the screen is most of your work situated in? Uh, all of the participants can answer this question now and I will say it out loud. We have digital humanities as a term, we have natural language processing, computational linguistics, artificial intelligence, computer science, all of the above or uh, other if you're from a different field uh, I'm focusing now more on the language data fields. Uh, and I'm very happy to hear from our participants as well. Malvina? Yeah, I'm very glad I don't have to just click and I can say a few words because it's not an easy, straightforward answer. I'm glad about the hype on uh, AI because now when I'm asked what I do, I can say I work with AI and language. Uh, globally, I would say that I identify a little bit with everything that is there. I'm originally a computational linguist and I do NLP, I develop applications as well. And I do think that whenever you actually investigate a task in NLP, you learn something about language. So I definitely do computational linguistics. And I do find that AI is encompassing uh, all of this if you talk about AI and language, definitely. Okay. Thank you. See? Uh, 
Uh, yes. Um, well, my main field uh, from the fields here listed is, uh, is natural language processing. Um, but as we um, are well developing techniques which have, uh, well, where the machine learning plays an important role, uh, you could say also artificial intelligence or computer science. Uh, so I'm also a fellow for natural language processing of the European lab of uh, learning and intelligence systems. Um, but I'm very much interested also uh, in digital humanities and computational linguistics. Uh, so all of these fields, and yeah, as I'm a member of com the computer science department, I think all of these fields apply, but natural language processing is probably the most important. Okay, uh, Jan? Uh, I, I probably should also say all of the above, even though in different times my focus was on different things. My background is computer science, and then I studied uh, computational linguistics and NLP, which I think are naturally part of uh, AI, even though it was not uh, uh, touted as, the, as that, uh, you know, five years ago. And then uh, in my ma managerial role in, in Linda, uh, we have uh, extended our uh, coverage also to digital humanities. So I think that so, since we are now serving both the Clarin and Daria communities, I can consider myself, at least from the management point of view, also involved in digital humanities. Okay, thank you. And Vukosi? Yeah, this is a tough question. Uh, in the same way, it, 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 as time go, has gone on, things have changed. Um, my background, uh, for me, I started in engineering and working on AI, uh, moving to computer science, specifically uh, working on reinforcement learning, which is like you know, a very fascinating uh, part of, of machine learning. Um, and over the last five or so years, have moved towards natural language processing. And by doing that, then you, like, you know, being based on, in South Africa, you then face the challenges that come with low resource languages. And I'm finally, like, you know, I'm still in the computer science department at, at the University of Pretoria, uh, but I do have collaborators across um, even the humanities and the social sciences, uh, especially who bring in that experience of linguistics, uh, because that's not something I have studied, but I am now discovering and also learning about through these collaborations. So okay. it will be a bit of all of the above um, in a way, but yes, uh, my major background and the time that spent a lot of times is on AI, uh, on the techniques there, and then how those can also then transfer into language. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's look at the results of this poll. Um, we have 110 active participants, uh, attendees watching our panel, so that's already good news, with most of them identifying uh, with digital humanities. Uh, very few uh, identify with artificial intelligence as their first uh, choice. Um, of course, it's a trick question. Some of these uh, terms are sort of nested in one another uh, because natural language processing is the language aspect of AI. Uh, so um, uh, it's not, uh, I should have had nested answers, of course, but it's way too complicated for Zoom to uh, figure out how we define our field. And I think there are still differences in how we define our field. Uh, good, that's our uh, first short question and another very uh, uh, question that I ask the participants to answer very briefly is how involved are you with Clarin? And I'm also asking this uh, question to our audience. So how involved are you with Clarin? Uh, and let's have uh, Jan answer first. Uh, thank you. I. Um... <clears throat> I am involved with the Czech uh, Clarinode from the very beginning since uh, 2010, uh, and also uh, I am a uh, member of the of the technical committee of Clarin uh, as uh, for the for for the Czech Republic uh, centers, which we now have two, um, and so I, I I have to say I'm I'm involved from the very beginning. In fact, I was uh, in part uh, involved in the activities before Clarin uh, came into existence because we were always interested in in uh, collecting and building language resources. So it was natural that we came in uh, to, to many activities which uh, preceded uh, the creation of Clary. Okay, thank you. Uh, Malvina? 
Yes, I uh, have not been officially involved with uh, Klarin, um, but of course I am very glad about its existence. I, of course, I do use uh, resources and as a group uh, in uh, Groningen we have been involved and we are involved by providing resources, using resources and so. So I'm actually very, very happy about its existence, although I haven't been part officially of the organization. Okay, thank you, Vukosi. Um, yes, um, I'm, uh, I know of Sharon and I'm more connected to one of its observers, which is uh, the South African Digital Language Resource Center or SADILA um, in here, but I have, we, we do monitor some of what's going on at Clarion, especially on some of the more continent-wide projects where we're trying to understand what's the best way to create language uh, resources, mm -hmm. especially in a way that's more distributed and not connected to large um, research institutions. Okay, thank you. And last but not least, Sin. Um, yes, um, I have been to, um, we have been involved in Clarin events, so conferences. Um, I was also in the past, um, if I remember correctly, uh, a part of a Clarin center here uh, in Belgium. Uh, we have applied for, uh, yeah, for, we have uh, submitted a new uh, proposal uh, to our National Science Foundation and we hope uh, to hear good news that uh, this proposal will be accepted soon so we can be again much more involved uh, in CLARI. Okay, great. So we have uh, a member from the beginning very involved. We have an aspiring member, uh, which is also a past member. We have someone related to uh, 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 an uh, observing member, uh, Sadilar, and a very happy user, uh, Malvina. So this is a, a great diversity of people to talk uh, about uh, Clarin with. I'm going to end the poll also. Uh, 117 people voted and uh, Half of you are involved uh, and another 21% are super involved. They are really the core organization. So about 70% of our uh, conference participants are involved with Clarin. Others are users or uh, uh, event goers or have no connection to Clarin at all at this point. So uh, let's hope that um, uh, we can um, spike your interest for those that um, have been peripherally uh, involved with Claren or none at all. I'm going to ask Jan, what reason do they have to become more interested in Claren? What uh, is your number one um, uh, promo talk for Claren? Uh, uh, number one, I don't know. I mean, uh, it, it, it's it's only all positive if you join Claren, of course. Uh, I. I think there are many reasons to join Clarin, and it, it, it's hard to, to pick one. But uh, I think the most important is the community. You get uh, support, information, uh, um, uh, tools, of course, and, and, and language resources in, in, a, in a way which, uh, uh, which is certainly much better described and findable than, than if you just uh, search uh, the world or the web. Yeah. Um, the uh, you get good practices in in various projects or uh, by by attending conferences even though today you have to do it virtually but but still and and, and last but not least uh, if you get involved and you persuade the national authorities to become part of it, it it usually means money and it's also very important to be able to actually have a group of people um, it doesn't matter if it's small or bigger uh, but but you can do a lot uh, you know, for your your country or your colleagues, uh, as well as the, to the others in Europe, and and it, it is all, uh, it is everything goes for all. So so you can only gain if you if you join Clarin. Okay, great. That's very clear. Um, some people in the chat are wondering uh, how many people are attending. Apparently, they can't see that. We have 150 attendees currently, of which we had 110, 120 active in the polls so far. So that's a nice idea of who we're talking to uh, from all of those different fields. Uh, thanks, Jan. You spoke about um, uh, good practices as well, uh, especially then uh, in data creation, uh, data collection, data spreading. Uh, and, uh, and I'm wondering about uh, uh, Malvina's opinion in this sense. You've been uh, involved a lot also with data collection and creation, not within Clarin, but in your own projects. Uh, and I'm wondering what 
what is currently needed in the field of language related AI um, for the future. So what, what should Clarence start thinking of for the future or what is currently happening that you want to share with us? Uh, I actually, I really like this question. <laughs> Thank you. It's, uh, it's true. I've been involved in quite a lot of uh, data collection and corpus creation for also in terms of shared tasks for various languages. And uh, now it, it used to be the case that uh, data was a big problem in terms of availability. And I'm sure it still is for some languages or many languages, but there is a lot of data around. And what I actually find now very complex instead is not finding the data, is actually knowing what to do with the data, also from a legal perspective. I mean, I am not always certain about uh, collecting data. Is that okay, what I am doing? Can I collect this data? Can I scrape this data? And so one thing is collection. Another thing is storing. Can I, all this data that I could collect, can I store it? Can I store it all? Can I only do part of it? And can I share it? Uh, so once I have this great data set uh, that I was able to scrape and uh, maybe annotate, maybe or not, maybe store, now can I give it to other people? So I think there's a lot of, as I've been talking to some people about this as well in our legal offices. And I think there is very little clarity overall on what can be done. So one thing actually that I would very much uh, appreciate, I think Claren will be a great, great, great uh, like uh, core center for setting up some good practices in this sense, like uh, what Jan was saying. I think that would be great if we could have a centralized overview of what's possible and how this should be done. Mm -hmm. And not only for coherence and uh, trying to make this uniform, but also really as like legally what, uh, how we should yeah. behave in this. And I think that'd be Clarin great. has its uh, branches in um, almost all or a lot of the European countries. They could not only bundle the European laws, but also what are the national differences. Yeah. Yeah, and especially having also sharing data across the world as you want to do, uh, then you really need to know what you're doing. And I think it, it would be wonderful if it was not really up to single researchers to do this, but there was mm -hmm. some general infrastructure for this. I'd love yeah. that. Yeah. Um, we have in the chat, Daria Fischer is commenting that uh, Clarin does have a legal and ethical issues committee. Um, I don't personally know, but maybe Jan can chime in, if this committee is, is open already to questions or do they publish about uh, the good practices uh, that uh, researchers can access that? Or is it yeah. only within Clarin as a supportive committee? Uh, certainly, the, the the legal committee does a lot of work uh, on, on, on in this area. Uh, um, I mean, we we are we also have a member of our our team in in that group, and we know it's a it's a very complicated situation. I mean, it's very hard to say very briefly what it is. I know I see the questions here about the speech data, which are even worse from this point of view than textual data, because then uh, you know GDPR is even more uh, difficult issue, uh, and and copyright is all always there. Um, the situation should be slightly better if I can say that. Uh, when uh, uh, all countries uh, adopt the copyright directive. I know that there are various views, but I'm of course talking about the articles three and four, which are relevant for language data. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but of course, uh, and, and every country has to do it by I think June next year. Um, of, of course, we will have to see how this is actually then implemented if any disputes uh, come up, because this is a very new thing for Europe. Uh, uh, but, but we all hope that uh, it will improve the situation for research, not only research, actually, even for applications uh, yeah. and use of data in, in NLP. Other than that, for data collection, um, I think uh, everyone is uh, free to ask uh, the legal committee and uh, uh, some hints uh, might be found also at the various centers of Clarin when you are when you are depositing your resource. Uh, of course, that's the last step, but but you can also look at uh, the instructions and the description how to deposit the resource, and it will also give you some hints. You know okay. what licenses are preferred, how how to go on. Not for every case, of course, but but at least some something. Yeah. 
Yeah, thank you. The, the committee that was named is not only the uh, legal committee, uh, also ethical issues are, um, uh, are handled. Uh, does any of the panelists want to uh, comment on, on ethical aspects of data creation? Maybe I will give it back to Malvina or, and then of course you can react. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's not only about data creation. I think uh, there are a lot of ethical issues uh, involved in what we do also in uh, NLP applications. And there's quite a lot of uh, ethical debate going on in, in, the, in the field of the Association for Computational Linguistics in general. And I just had a very, I think it's, it's very good that we deal with ethical issues. And I also think though, it's very, very good that we keep continue uh, working on aspects that can raise ethical issues. I think the research community has to do this. Okay. I wouldn't want that because there's some ethical issue involved, then we stop working on this or avoid working on this because I do find, for example, I work on author profiling and I know this raises a lot of ethical issues, but as a researcher, I want to work on this and as a research community, especially because this is research in the public area. Mm -hmm. So you I don't think want it's to very leave important. it just for commercial actors to uh, commercial companies precisely. to only precisely yes I think the community has to work on these aspects with the awareness that they raise ethical issues. Okay, thank yeah. you, Vukosi. Uh, do you still want to add something? Um, yeah, so I, I'm primarily working on uh, like you know African languages, currently South African languages. Is you, you do come up on um, ways to yes collect uh, doing annotations also with people. Uh, and trying to get collaborators who can work uh, more efficiently. But on the collection side is like, you know, we are, have gotten to that part where there is a lot of data that's online. Uh, sure, not a lot of it is, is in these local languages, but the ones that are, now you have to navigate these uh, more legal nuances to understand. Uh, I think on the African continent, the challenge that we've seen uh, through, uh, we have this AI4D project and a little bit on, on the Masakane project, is having very differing views on what it means to even scrape data off a website. Like this is not very clear. I think for the EU or the UK, uh, some of the laws I'm, 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 I'm um, very familiar with, there, there's some clarity on what it means to actually, if you're building, especially a machine learning model, or AI model, but not necessarily releasing data. And then yes, obviously now when you want to release the data, <laughs> there's a whole other set of, 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 of uh, le uh, legal issues that have to come in. But we need to get to a point, I think, um, especially in the Global South, where we can have more, uh, more clarity, as well as more people doing work in these areas. The, um, the age of social media has also brought in, I think, uh, very similar to Malvina, uh, all these new data for local languages as well. But now you have the ethics and, uh, of keeping the privacy of users and, and making sure that you can actually use that information in a way um, th th that is ethical and responsible and also does serve the greater good, right? Not just for yourself. Okay, um, yeah, and I want to, to as, a, as a last comment on this uh, legal and ethical uh, um, stance, is uh, refer back to the Claren Cafe that we have on, uh, on Monday, and I asked uh, Stephen Krauer, the co-founder of uh, Claren, um, what his hope was for the future of Claren, and he said, I hope that uh, copyright goes away. <laughs> Uh, that uh, that in the future we we will be less troubled by intellectual property rights in the way that um, in he's talking about different data not social media where privacy will remain uh, uh, adamant um, but more on on publishers books um, why can't we use that uh, data well because that person is still alive doesn't give us uh, permission uh, and so on so um, uh, that's a hope of Stephen Kauer. I don't know if you share that, um, but I wanted to continue with Vukosi because not only do you work on, on uh, big data, on uh, lots of uh, um, uh, big data sets scraped uh, as well uh, as others, uh, you also have a lot of experience working with uh, lower resource languages, for example, the, low, uh, the uh, local languages of South Africa. Um, what, what role is there still uh, in AI for lower resource languages, given the dominance of English in, well, research in the world, but also in NLP, uh, there's a big dominance of English. What's your opinion? 
Uh, yeah, thanks for that question. I think it's it's very important um, uh, because it's it's not just in research. Uh, we might think of it from our perspective, uh, but then also the way more and more of the internet is becoming monolingual. Uh, the initial kind of a lot of the the large um, websites that are accessed on a day to day basis. So on because of that, if we're thinking like in South Africa right now, we're looking at these emerging technologies that are coming in and really disrupting, um, you know, just like AI. Um, we do know that people then uh, having access to the internet, it also means that they want to have access to information and having ways to actually translate and be able to work in a local language is very important uh, on there. Uh, further, um, uh, for myself, and I think a lot of our community in the, in the African continent, uh, you, we, we want to shape these systems that are coming along. Right, there should not be something simply of you are taking a system that comes from somebody else and then using it. If you don't shape it, then we're still seeing these challenges of bias uh, that, that are coming in and you're also not really uh, evaluating what the local needs actually are. So language again becomes very important in that if you're building these systems and you're building them with local languages. Ah, I think you're, last... so you're connecting both issues now, right? So um, we had previously bias, ethical bias in uh, data and maybe focusing on the local languages can help reduce the bias because um, yeah. those might be the people that are less represented in other data. Yeah, and in other data. And uh, g given this, uh, then is how do we then also capture indigenous knowledge, right? Mm -hmm. We do find that well, obviously languages are not the same and the ways that they actually capture information is also not the same. So there's a lot that's missed in, in some ways in having people being able to communicate and also uh, 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 like, you know, share their culture as well as the knowledge that they have within um, kind of uh, those cultures. So uh, uh, for me, I would have never thought like, you know, I, as I said, I came from AI and machine learning now I would have thought I'm getting to a point where you're getting into that kind of more digital um, cultural preservation. But now you, you see it as you're doing this work, how important it is you, we interact, like, you know, you might be interacting with people at Wikipedia or Wikimedia about, hey, uh, of our languages, like, you know, in South Africa, very few of them have local language Wikipedia. And this is very important because now uh, for a lot of people, like for very large companies in, in the private sector, they just, pull data that comes from these languages from there and say, we built the model that now works in this language. But then when you start evaluating, you find it very poor in a way, just because you don't, that resource is either very poorly constructed or it's very small. Mm -hmm. So and there is still all of this that still has to go on um, and, and, and we need to kind of still work on. Yeah. Um, I think we, can, we, we definitely can draw a parallel uh, though uh, in some way between the local African languages and local European languages, because I think Claren plays an important role in getting, uh, at giving attention to all the local uh, languages and, and work on a lot of more different languages than just uh, English. Um, I th seen, I haven't heard much from you yet. I want to direct this question to you if you want. Um, have you, uh, how, how often do you work with languages apart from English? Well, actually not so often, uh, but we work from time to time with languages. We have worked with Dutch, of course, with French, German, uh, also because I had some Chinese researchers, researchers, so with Chinese, and once with Arabic, but that's all. So that's very limited, actually. Yeah. And probably this has to do because of the resources. Yeah. Um, and still, access, these are quite access big to languages. I'm uh, sorry? And still, the extra languages you name are quite big languages in science. Yes, absolutely. So they are not uh, really local languages uh, that are spoken at some small part in the world. Um, but I think the problem is resources. You have to, when we publish papers, yeah, we have to use benchmarking data sets, compare with these, and, and sometimes we create our own data sets, but it's always a big effort. Uh, so, so I think the resources are there, the bottleneck. Otherwise, we, we would have used um, for our technologies uh, many more languages to develop them. Yeah. What, uh, what holds you back on creating those resources? For example, the languages mm. from Belgium, uh, French and Dutch, you would have access to enough people or, or uh, people in the field to create that. What holds you back? Um, 
what, what yeah um, sometimes we create such resources but then it's more in like a project with private companies and also then these resources they don't become public Mm -hmm. uh, so, for instance, when we annotate French data or Dutch data for some of our tasks, they still remain proprietary. Okay. Uh, this similar um, occasion happened with, uh, we used some medical data from the university hospitals, which were written in Dutch. But again, yeah, you, there you have the privacy issue. So these data cannot leave the hospital. Yeah. So these so are all these restrictions that are out there. So it's still a big tension on, on um, availability of data, again, uh, related to legal issues uh, and, and uh, property rights. Um, again, yes. And in this case, specifically attention between public domain and, uh, and uh, commercial data. Yes. Um, uh, Sina, I'm staying with you because uh, I, um, I wonder what for you is, what do you see currently in the future of AI? What are our data needs other than We've talked about low resource languages and, and legal issues. What is something we really have to push for in the future in order to keep up with all the new research, question, research questions that we have? Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, well, there are definitely a number of big challenges eh, in, in natural language processing in particular, which is a bit my field, both in the fields of language generation and language understanding. I'm personally most interested in, in language, natural language understanding. And there I think a very big challenge is to how to deal with uh, perceptual and social context because language functions in an environment. And this comes especially apparent if you have applications like talking to a machine, talking to your household robot, to your self-driving car. Mm -hmm. So. It's about a, a visual and auditory environment that you talk and you, you will speak in a very natural way as a human. Uh, so you have to combine their conception, uh, perception with, uh, with a language understanding. And so it's still a big problem how we will uh, represent this information, how we will integrate this mm -hmm. in our natural language understanding systems. Yeah. And with it comes also the question, uh, how do we uh, capture common sense? Because when we humans talk to each other, um, we assume that we have a lot of background knowledge, mm -hmm. uh, which we both share eh, when I talk to you, but the machine does not have that knowledge. Yeah. And there again, I think, looking at these perceptual, visual, uh, uh, social context, and how to learn that common sense knowledge from that kind of information uh, is for me a big challenge yeah. and, and how we can combine all these things so mm -hmm. seamlessly uh, still raises still a lot of questions. What, what would you say is, uh, are the big applications uh, for, for this form of natural language understanding that you're saying uh, to contextualize uh, well, one, one uh, application we are currently also working on is um, talking to your self-driving car because you, you want to stop that car. Maybe yeah, you want to pick up a friend uh, next to a tree or next to a blue car which is parked out there. So you give instructions to that machine and the machine also sees something like mm -hmm. your robot. It sees it has some environment or it, it listens also to sounds um, and you speak to that, to that machine also, uh, there is speech. So there are a lot of modalities involved in, in all these applications. Yeah. And, yeah. and so your car would need to know that the brown and green thing that they're heading towards is a tree and that you would say, avoid it, please. Uh, no, yeah, hopefully and, not. And more than that, because <laughs> this is something object recognition is. is uh, yes. So capable of, though they don't understand what a tree is. Uh, um, well, so. we, have to, we have to have the machines to understand all this, mm -hmm. both their visual environment, auditory mm -hmm. environment, and other perceptual environment, and also language, and also language functions in a, a social context. So yeah. also that environment for certain applications uh, needs to be understood by a machine. And in that respect, also, I think what we talked about, uh, how to create resources for this. Um, 
is also a, an issue. Uh, so we would like to have more resources um, where language functions in a more broader context. Yeah. Um, we have a, a question related to this topic uh, by Kunrat de Smet, uh, and he said, as AI provides us with more powerful black boxes that almost do magic, do we lose interest into how language is structured from an analytical perspective? Can I forward that question to Malvina? Yes, you can. I think it's a, yeah, it's a question that I think pops up. Uh, kind of regularly now with the, all these uh, models that are a little bit uh, uninterpretable. But I have to say that uh, I think interpretability is an issue um, and it's worked on. So there is a lot of work uh, in the NLP community, in the CL community that goes into trying and understand actually what the models are doing from a linguistic perspective. Mm -hmm. So I think actually there is a lot of interest definitely in still trying to find out what linguistically these models do. So I'm yeah. actually very positive in this sense. And I do believe that a lot of the work that we see in language transferability or task transferability of large models with fine tuning or any sort of uh, retraining actually tell, tell us a lot about mm -hmm. what linguistic aspects are encoded and learned by these models. So I, I do think actually there is uh, a lot of, interest. yes, very much so. Yes, okay. that's it's this interesting is what... because the same uh, Kunrat Smet uh, posted another question much earlier in this panel uh, and he commented many would consider NLP and CL uh, to be the same field. And I think we're here at the point where he himself may uh, prove uh, otherwise. Because for me, computational linguistics has this focus on linguistics, on the language aspect, while NLP is more focused on the application uh, and, uh, and making it work. Uh, I don't know if my panelists agree with me. I think this, can I, can I, yes. just, uh, I think this uh, is how at least it used to be and how I used to see it. Uh, so NLP is more focused on the task, on the end application, while computational linguistics are more, is more focused on understanding language via computational models. But I think now, by now, they're quite conflated. And I'm yes. not sure we still want to separate it out. Uh, although I still find that it, there can be um, like we found, uh, we found now an, an issue where it's useful to separate them, uh, I guess. Uh, yes. But, um, but we totally acknowledge that there's different naming uh, conventions in the world and in the field. So this is not a prescriptive uh, way of uh, you have to use it. Um, uh, does uh, anyone still want to um, contribute to the question on the future of uh, AI? What are, what are the resources we will need? Uh, seen introduced uh, visual context and world knowledge, common sense as aspects that we, uh, that we uh, would need. Foucault, you want to react? Um, yeah, I think on, on moving forward in, in, in some of these spaces is, is going to have um, like we, we have AI, uh, the tools are becoming um, much more accessible. How then do you connect that with the resource gathering? And then how do you then also connect that with local skills that can actually work on that, right? you know, to provide that local context uh, kind of in a way. Um, uh, there are now more and more projects where people are, are working uh, uh, to push just, just because uh, it's almost like the clock is ticking. There's going to be a period where now people are going to view it as being not worth the time anymore to try, <laughs> especially for lower resource languages to, to get them into, because then it's, you know, you focus on something else. It, it, it is, these are some of the challenges that come in because mm -hmm. you might want to work um, uh, on NLP and be creating great um, uh, uh, NLP work, AI work, but then now you aren't joining kind of what most people are going to, you're, you're going towards uh, uh, this other direction, then it becomes harder to either publish or get, or, or get money in a way. So right now there's, there's, there's moves to, to deal with these things. Um, I did put a link on the Masakani project where there, I think it's over 55 researchers working together on African languages and dealing with all these things live as, as it's going on, how the legal issues, how the collection is done, how the curation all at once, just so that we can do it now as opposed to waiting a few, like, you know, a few years for things to be uh, kind of correct. 
um, through the AI4D project and also the Lacuna Fund, now there's funding to actually cu collect and curate these data sets. We'll see, like, you know, from uh, AI4D for the last uh, about a year, we've been able to see many great ideas on how to collect data and make it uh, accessible. Now with the Lacuna Fund, that's looking at kind of millions of dollars of of, 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 of uh, funding that's available for these things. We will now are looking forward to 2021 and what this means actually then for the NLP community, right? Because now these new data sets will become available. There will be like, you know, under Creative Commons or open licenses. And now it will be what tasks can be done. And the more we have these available, uh, the, the more things then we will see these then coming into the mainstream. Yeah. So we have some views of the of the of the future. What's important for AI? Now we're still in the Clarin 2020 conference. My next question uh, has also been posed by Daria Fisher, um, but it seems evident. What role should Clarin play? What's the position of a research infrastructure in the field of AI, and what would, should that research infrastructure do now so that we are relevant for the researchers of tomorrow? So, yeah, yeah. yeah, okay. Uh, I mean, I I can't probably talk for Clarin as a whole, but certainly what what we would like to do in the, in the, in the Czech uh, Clarin Center, and I I very much uh, liked uh, what Cien has said about the connection of language to the real world, and uh, you know the need for more data uh, to to looking at knowledge representation uh, with with multimodal sources and and so on and this is something we uh, we haven't done in clarin because of course it was primarily focused on language but i think it's uh, about time to uh, to try to uh, you know deepen or or start cooperation with the other fields in ai um, which uh, Unfortunately, do not have a real infrastructure <laughs> to to directly cooperate, but but certainly there are networks of people working in AI from various perspectives and uh, collecting data in a similar way that we did for language. And uh, I think it would be very good to to uh, have more ties to these, to to try the interdisciplinary approach, uh, to to get. Uh, in contact and be able to provide data to researchers and, and support research in, in, in cooperation of all these areas together. Yeah. Uh, any of my other panelists want to uh, react? You are more outside of Clarin. So from that perspective, what do you think a research infrastructure should do now so that we remain relevant for tomorrow? Malvina. I think uh, I, I don't know how feasible certain things are, but one of the limitations I think that a lot of research groups uh, find is actually computing power. I mean, now to, it's not only a matter of uh, finding data for low resource languages, that often goes together hand in hand with lack of actually technical infrastructure. And that again, I think can be an issue if we want to develop models and tools and resources for like uh, as many languages and and also multi, also multi multimodal models uh, they will require a lot of power and that's yeah. something that i think we encounter as researchers often as a bottleneck and i don't know really if this is something that uh, <laughs> could be up to clarin maybe not but i think it's something that we have to bear in mind uh, mm -hmm. for the future definitely yeah. and i saw vukosi react uh, positively to your uh, statement as well so maybe there is something uh, to be done in in like borrow the clarin server uh, for your <laughs> next project uh, who knows um, we're approaching the end of the panel because we have a, a restricted time i want to thank everyone for uh, posing uh, some more questions in the chat uh, unfortunately, I don't have uh, time for all of them. Uh, my last question goes to Jan, and um, very briefly, Jan, because you're here as a representative of Clarin, um, what do you think are the, what is the key, or what are the key takeaways for Clarin from this panel? Hmm. 
so again, I'm I'm not sure if I can uh, uh, speak for the for the whole Clarin, but I'll be bold. But, you can speak for them. That's fine. Yeah, uh, they will do uh, it. But that's uh, that's uh, that's uh, I think in part what I said before. Um, uh, Clarin still should still fulfill the the basic role and be a language resource and technology infrastructure. So the project that Vukosi was talking about, this is perfect match, and we should look uh, to other areas. I mean, there are seven thousand languages in the world, and probably one hundred of them have some resources, uh, not not alone sufficient, and and it is important that that we go and and the the missing languages are not even small languages; they are simply low resource, but maybe spoken by ten million people or more. So so this is certainly something uh, uh, that that Clarin could could do. This is outside of Europe, of course, mostly, but uh, but uh, still there will be a great uh, a great achievement if we have uh, resources for the various NLP tasks that we can now do with, uh, let's say, 100 languages, uh, even uh, with even more languages. And the other thing is the cooperation with the other fields. Language is not isolated in terms of uh, usage and applications. I mean, certainly I agree with one of the questions that we should not abandon linguistics, uh, of course, and we should study how language works uh, internally, but also how it is related to the real world. And for that, we need cooperation with AI specifically and with people doing research in many other fields like psychology, sociology, and so on. Okay, thank you uh, so much, Jan, for this uh, key takeaway. Um, I want to thank all the panelists for your, uh, for your val valuable time, for your relevant answers and uh, pleasant um, interaction. Um, this was the panel on AI and language data and research infrastructure for Clarin 2020. Uh, I want to thank you all uh, for attending.